Urban Student Global Brief magazine, let's talk about Canada's three wicked national unity problems post-election. Urban Student Global Brief magazine, welcome back. Thanks for subscribing to our YouTube channel. Read us in print around the world. Our website, www.globalbrief.ca. And please do subscribe to us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. We do it for you in all the languages. Enjoy your brief. Now, Canada has just exited a major national election. We've got a liberal minority government, the Conservatives, the leading opposition party, the uh, Bloc Québécois separatist party in Quebec, uh, resurgent, the second opposition party, and the New Democratic Party, i.e. the NDP, the third opposition party. The Green Party, slightly empowered, not, a, not very significant, but, but, but there nonetheless. That's the composition of the Parliament. It's not unexpected. What is unexpected to some people in some parts of Canada, I would say one, well, many people in many parts of Canada, uh, is the fact that Canada is suddenly faced not just with international pressures. Remember, our international pressures are quite significant. We've got the A, the C, the R, the E, America, China, Russia, Europe. We've been through this many times. Those are international pressures, uh, which were not largely mentioned in, in, in this election, but nonetheless were explicated in our, in our past lectures and, and will be there to roost in major ways in the coming, uh, I would say, weeks and, and months. And, and Canada will have to reckon that. But the major paradoxes are the internal pressures. We've got not one, not two, but three national unity challenges on our hands. They're not yet crises, but taken in total, they could form uh, one biblical crisis for Canada. And remember, we started this lecture series by saying, students' law, modern states last about 60 years, after which they collapse through a combination of war and constitutional collapse. Canada's lasted 152 years, neither with war nor constitutional collapse. It's been steady as she goes, largely peaceable accretion. The last major conflict was in 1870, 1871 with the, with the Americans at the border. All of these were pacified. We've had a good century and a half. So we're past our due date on historical laws for some sort of reckoning either to constitutional uh, pressures or international pressures. But again, we ought to look at these as as two sides of the same Canadian coin. One side is, is war and strategy, and the other is the domestic order and the Constitution. These are part of the same sets of equations. Those who tend to look at foreign affairs as divorced from international domestic affairs or domestic affairs as completely abstracted from what's happening in the world are missing at least half of the boat. We ought to look at them as a system. And if this is the international part of the system, the domestic part of the system, is suggesting three national un unity pressures on Canada. First, the Quebec question, the rise of the Bloc Québécois, is representative of a growing, uh, if not angst in Quebec, at least a strong resurgence of political preferences that are à la différence to ROC, the rest of Canada. Uh, where this goes is untested. It's still a hypothesis on, on, on many fronts, but it is a national unity pressure to be sure. The Quebec question. It's interested me, all of my political, all of my uh, uh, professional career, and certainly interests 21 CQ since our, our creation. Second pressure, and this is unexpected certainly in central Canada, and I would say to some extent in, in Ottawa, the rise of Western, not just anger, but coherent calls for some sort of separate arrangement from uh, the rest of Canada. Now, uh, that those calls are crystallizing, they don't have uh, strong leadership yet, uh, but they must be reckoned with uh, in a national unity configuration. So that's a second point, the rise of Western separatism, differentiation, and, and fueled by a deep, deep frustration, nay, anger. And the third one is, the third one is unarticulated at all, but it is perhaps the most salient national unity pressure over the next decade or, or two, if we survive the first two pressures, and that is where are we going with indigenous reconciliation? Uh, I'm extremely supportive and sympathetic, as are we with 21CQ on indigenous reconciliation. It's a moral imperative for Canada. Uh, 
few can object to that. But you've got the moral imperative and you've got the strategic slash constitutional reality. Where is this going? If you have uh, 500 plus empowered First Nations, sophisticated with not just consultative, uh, consultative um, prerogatives on, on national processes, but indeed over time vetoes and all sorts of political prerogatives. Is this entity we call Canada governable over time? And if you take all three of those pressures in total, the Quebec question, the Western question, and the Indigenous uh, question, that is the telos, the end point of Indigenous reconciliation as it's currently conceived, can we govern this baby? If we can, we'll have a great century, particularly if we can manage these other wicked forces. But if not, it could end very painfully. And that is an outcome that I will do everything uh, to fight against, and, and which interests me in, in, in uh, both intellectual and policy terms. It's part of uh, the, the writing that we do in Global Brief and the thinking we do in, in 21 CQ. So let's go through all three of those uh, domestic pressures and describe them. And in future, lectures will go into some of the what's to be done. We'll hint at that for now, but f let us start at least with some description of the nature of those three national unity pressures on Canada that will be felt acutely at the political level in the new government uh, immediately upon being sworn in. The first question uh, of national unity is, of course, the Quebec question. And I want to spin it in a slightly different way. Those who say, who have been saying since, uh, I would say, um, 2009, 2010, that the Quebec question is no longer on the table, somehow that the, um, the, the fall of the Bloc Québécois to almost non-party non status and the ouster of the PQ from the central, central political discourse in Quebec proper, that those who are suggesting that the Quebec question is gone and that Quebec no longer wants separatism or that separatism or independence are no longer uh, a major question in, in the political discourse. Uh, both neither, neither understand what they're talking about nor have a good sense of, of the history of all states. That is, these things are, have a cyclical character. It is, these are forces to be reckoned with throughout the life of Canada and they are forces that could tear Canada apart very quickly. Yeah. Uh, there are many examples of federations of big countries that have been torn apart by chaotic processes and separatist processes and bad decision making. You don't one need only look at the Brexit chaos right now very rapidly. And this is uh, a, a force that is, is back and it will be need to, need to be um, taken on its face, perhaps with a, with a more modern face, but with great strategy and sophistication. A uh, couple of points about the Quebec question. First, uh, those who say on, in, a, in the English Canada, I don't like that expression, but in English Canada, because English Canada is very diverse and it's, it's not all perfectly English speaking, it's highly multi-ethnic, but in English Canada, those who say that, oh, I wish Can Quebec would just, would just go, it would just make it that much easier and coherent and, and frictionless to govern Canada. This is some sort of uh, constitutional political nonsense that has to be, um, uh, as they say in, in, in French, uh, uh, rejeté du revers de la main. It must be ousted from the political discourse in, in Canada. It is a nonsense because if Quebec should leave the Federation or should go, perhaps through some sort of secession process, that would be the end of the Federation. Too cool, full stop. Right. I'm happy to debate anyone on that proposition. Canada would collapse. The reason it would collapse is that there would be no prime minister, no political force, and certainly not the current government that would be able to, with the departure of Quebec, the major territorial unit in the Federation, I would say the oldest one in, 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 in modern Canada, also in, in its corporate memory, leave aside the indigenous question to which we'll return, the removal of that from the, uh, the corpus of, of Canada would spell the end of the Canadian Federation. There would be no one, not only would there not be territorial continuity from east to west at all, but there would be no prime minister who would be able to bring back to the table Victoria, St. John's, Toronto, and Edmonton the day after and say, can we return to the status quo Anti, can we do it the way it was before Quebec separated and just call it Canada, except without Quebec? 
Remember, Canada is federated originally at four colonies, a tiny, on a huge territory, but a tiny slice of today's huge Canada. And it was much more Anglo-Saxon. It was much more uh, mentally uh, unified, although they, were, they had different interests vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Westminster. Today, Canada is just huge, and it is very regionalized. Ottawa is not uh, sufficiently uh, powerful and uh, forceful to be able to bring all these centrifugal forces together the day after Quebec is lobotomized from the Federation. So that would spell the end of Canada. Now that's a f the first point. We should never wish that process to happen because people would one day say after the fact, there was this amazing country in Canada, and some foolish people actually wish that part of it should go. Indeed, the major per territorial chunk should go, only to realize after the fact that they could not put Humpty Dumpty back together. And indeed, how many countries around the world and peoples around the world are fighting for territory and real estate and are just wishing in their deepest fan fancies to build a country called Canada, and yet there are some some lazy people in Canada who are wishing part of it away because it fulfills some sort of abstract, uh, frictionless proposition uh, for them. These people, unfortunately, do not know what they're talking about, and their advice should be taken with heaps and heaps of, of, of salt. Now, uh, the, the reverse proposition is for my Quebec colleagues. Uh, pour mes amis au Québec, uh, il y a un paradoxe au sein de la proposition de, de la souveraineté aussi, qui n'est pas euh, soulevé autant qu que désirable au sein de, 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 du débat politique au Québec. And the paradox is, is as follows. If you do the thought experiment of Quebec achieving sovereignty one day, then uh, the Quebec idea is that we would negotiate somehow as equals with ROC with the rest of Canada. The, the day after a successful Separat separatism run, or perhaps the, the eve after the day after a successful referendum with a clear majority, uh, Quebec would sit down at the leadership of Quebec would sit down with the leadership of the rest of Canada and negotiate a new entente. And what is not articulated, and this is very disingenuous or uh, pire encore, it's not realized in, in the Quebec debate, there is no rest of Canada. There might be a Quebec nation, although I would say territorially diminished the day after a successful separatism run, but the rest of Canada dissolves. So who is the vis-à-vis -vis for, for Quebec? Uh, Quebec would find itself in a very classical situation amongst uh, states with difficult borders, but it would be a completely new state without any self-government history in, in the context of of, of, of sovereign states, all of a sudden surrounded by the United States here, uh, some configuration of new states, multiple states to the east, combination of Ontario and the Atlantic now provinces now forming different unions, and I would argue uh, one, two, maybe three or four s new states to the west. And of course it would have to reckon with the giant to the north, the R. So Quebec's proposition is not uh, any simpler than Canada, but it's a smaller state all of a sudden, destabilized, and I would argue for a long time it would be a much poorer state because it would take a long time to recover from this chaos, at least one or two generations. And then you have border conflicts all over, in including possible, um, possibly militarized border conflicts because these would be all be contested by the various forces, including, by the way, the, the Americans, but certainly the rest of Canada trying to find I its bearing. So the, the Quebec question is very wicked, I hope we never get to the point where we, these thought experiments come to, to fruition. It needs to be reckoned with on its face. It doesn't have a solution. It has a management imperative um, around it. And, and Ottawa must manage it with the rest of, of Canada with great care, uh, with a good sense of humor, because uh, it, it, the vis-a-vis -vis in Quebec are, are, are extremely sophisticated. I have great colleagues in that, in that, in that uh, coterie uh, as well. And in the end, we will still hopefully build a great century for Canada. So that's the first uh, pressure we're going to need to manage. The second pressure is the Western pressure. This is newly come. It has different forces behind it. It is Alberta-led because of the, the pipeline issue, but also because of uh, an issue that we've discussed in the past lecture, the physical distance of 
the west from Ottawa is extremely germane still, including in the internet age. There's the, the distance, the emperor in Ottawa is very far, as the Chinese would say, or as the Russians would say, the государя правда не доходит. The truth never reaches the czar. So Ottawa is here, it might be sophisticated, but it never feels the reality of, of, of the west and is not thinking about the west on a, on a, on, as its daily bread because the west is simply far. So there is a, a tangible uh, growth in discontent there and anger in Ottawa, in, in Alberta. It takes different forms, I would say, in Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and, and in British Columbia. But this is uh, a Western angst that must be reckoned with. We're going to talk about the ways with which it can be reckoned in future lectures. That's the second force. I would add to that uh, a Northern alienation as well. And, and people don't realize that Yukon is to some extent the psychological extension of British Columbia. Northwest Territory is the psychological extension of Alberta. Uh, and this means that some of the anger and frustration in Alberta can be felt in, 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 in parts of the, the North as well, including on energy and infrastructure matters. And Ottawa is extremely far from them, doesn't feel the reality, uh, is often very naive and, and sees it as, as an unnecessary abstraction from the daily bread, which are the big cities along this, this, the A vector uh, of Canada. So a response, an intelligent response to the question of, of Western separatism slash alienation, anger must include the North, and I would argue in the future that it, it must include, maybe even be led by an Arctic strategy, an Arctic infrastructure and energy agenda, and that these must be looked at systematically. And then again, this brings the R and the C question and the A question to bear on domestic considerations as well. Final matter is that of the indigenous question. Now, in terms of the moral angle, it is extremely compelling to make the indigenous population of Canada co-equal. I'm all for it. It's the major public tragedy uh, of Canada. Indeed, you would say the paradox of Canada is that while the losing party in the Seven Years' War was made a co-equal in constitution, the losing party in, that is, the, the, the French-Canadian population govern as co-equals today, the losing party historically has not been made a co-equal. So that's a moral imperative. But moral imperative does not equate to strategic sagacity necessarily. Can we in Canada engineer the moral resuscitation of the Aboriginal indigenous population, which is extremely attractive, compelling, and is capturing much of the national imagination, properly so, can we do it without losing the country? That question is not asked by anyone. It, is it not thought of by our leaders? If it's not thought of, that's just patently irresponsible, because intellectually it makes a perfect sense. How can you govern uh, uh, pas à trois, when the original compact was pas à deux. Canada was pas à deux, a compact between the English and the French resuscitated from defeat, governing as co-equals. Right? The indigenous population was put aside, it existed, but it was nowhere empowered in the constitution. Indeed, it was completely marginalized. It existed, but was, was ignored for all intents and purposes in the political construct of, of Canada. 152 years later, we talk about indigenous reconciliation, morally extremely important. But can we now put a third leg into a constitution that was built on two pillars? It is not obvious, and it could tear the country apart, indeed fast. For one, can Ottawa manage this Baatwa? Yeah. Can it exert sovereignty, and can it get things done across these three pillars? Will all of the first two pillars, will each of the first two pillars accept the advent of the third pillar as co-equal? Will French Canada, will Quebec accept an empowered uh, uh, set of 500, first, 500 plus First Nations that now increasingly govern as, as co-equals to them? It's not obvious. It may be articulated publicly, but gutturally it must, must constitute a, a great source of, of angst if the intellect is pushed. And the same thing for the English Canadians uh, uh, component of Canada, which itself is quite diffuse and, and regionalized, it diffuse both in, in identity and, 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 and in regional character. So it is not obvious that the moral imperative uh, resonates with uh, 
constitutional coherence. This is going to take great management. I hope it makes it works because in the end Canada can become a marvelous compact and, and it will be modernized for 21st century needs, moral and strategic alike, reckoning with these terrible pressures. But if we don't succeed, then the country can be ripped apart and this can happen very fast as it does throughout history. I wish us well. I'm going to be part of the fight to keep it together, to make us great. Enjoy your brief.